our call to worship passage is first chronicles 16 23 to 25 sing to the lord all the earth tell of his salvation from day to day declare his glory among the nations his marvelous works among all the peoples for great is the lord and greatly to be praised and he is to be feared above all gods let's pray God, we thank you for this time and for the time to really just be still and to remember all that you've done and all that you are doing. We pray that you, your mercy and your grace would, I guess, just even be made more clear through this time and through our time in your word. May we not forget all that you've done and we just ask that you would be here and fill this place with your spirit and that our singing would would really be an overflow of gratitude for everything that you've done we pray this in your name amen Father, you worked your will. And I had no righteousness of my own. And I had no right to draw near your throne. But Father, you loved me still. And then in love before you laid the world's foundation, you predestined to adopt me as your own. You have raised me up so high above my station, and I'm a child of God by grace and grace alone. And you left your home to seek out the lost, and you knew the great and terrible cause, but Jesus, your face was set. And I worked my fingers down to the bone, but nothing I did could ever atone. But Jesus, you paid my debt. By your blood, I have redemption and salvation. Lord, you died that I might reap what you have sown. Then you rose that I might be a new creation. I am born again by grace, grace alone. And I was in darkness all of my life, and I never knew the day from the night. The Spirit, you made me see. And I swore I knew the way on my own, a head full of rocks, a heart made of stone. The Spirit, you moved in. Your touch, my sleeping spirit was awakened. On my dark and dark, the light of Christ has shown. I'm called into a kingdom that cannot be shaken. I'm heaven's citizen by grace and grace alone. So I'll stand in faith by grace. I will run the race by grace and grace alone. And I will slay my sins by grace and grace alone. And I will reach the end by grace and grace alone. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. on 
heaven's mercy see. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, holy, holy is He. Sing a new song to Him who sits on heaven's mercy seat. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of kings. go ahead now and transition to a time of prayer that we can have before us and the Lord, a time of confessing sin and turning from sin in our own lives. So I want to encourage us as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ to, to use this time to be reflecting on our week, uh, to reflecting on, uh, even today, just ways that maybe we've um, not loved God with all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our soul, all of our strength, uh, ways that we have not loved our neighbor as ourselves, and to confess that to God. He knows. Uh, but he wants to work powerfully in our lives, uh, overcoming sin, overcoming struggles, and becoming more like Christ. And to confess that and ask God for the, the help, the strength to, to grow in us the character of Jesus. And if you're not a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, it's a great time to uh, ask God to reveal himself to you uh, through this service. And so let's go ahead and take a moment now, just uh, between us and God, in prayer uh, before our King. Go ahead and pray together. Father, we, we thank you for the gospel. We thank you that um, in Jesus we have his righteousness that uh, we don't have. As we sung, uh, we have no righteousness of our own. And there's no way we could stand before a good, perfect God based upon our morality. And so, Jesus, thank you that you've given us yours through faith in you. And we, we can confidently uh, know that we are 
accepted and loved and adopted into your family because of your righteousness. And you are committed to growing us as members of your family uh, to be more like to be more like you. And we pray you'd continue to do that, uh, that you would use uh, this service, you would use the power of your word uh, to continue to shape us, to have the attitude of Christ, to have the heart of Christ. Um, we pray, Lord, for our church that you would grow us to be more Christ-like uh, as the people, as, as your people, and you would use uh, your word by the power of your spirit. But Father, we continue to pray for um, our, our city and our state, Lord, that uh, you would continue to work powerfully and bring many people. Lord, during these challenging uh, and and um, just unprecedented times, for that you would <clears throat> cause people, many people, to recognize that there is no Savior except you, and that uh, salvation is only found in Jesus. And so we pray you would do a great renewal in our community, uh, in, in the city and state that we uh, live in, and that you would use your churches, Lord, and we lift up just every, every church that is yours, uh, that, that we would be unified as we uh, advance the gospel here in the island, and that you'd continue to use us in the relationships, in the connections we have with our communities uh, to continue that good uh, work of your kingdom. And we pray, Father, today, Lord, that you'd continue to, to work through your word, bring healing where there needs to be healing, bring hope where there's hopelessness, bring power where, where there is weakness, uh, bring uh, affection for you where there is maybe coldness and dryness in our own spiritual lives. So do this powerfully by your spirit. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, hey, thank you guys so much for coming and joining us here at uh, Harbor New Uwanu. Uh, we're going to just uh, go over a quick announcement, and then we'll jump right into today's passage. So real quick, we've got um, an opportunity coming up with all four Harbor congregations starting in September called Harbor U, short for University. So our vision is to, within the four congregations, North Shore, West Side uh, Town, and then us, is to train uh, ministry leaders. Uh, so if you're just interested in just growing as a, as a leader, uh, or for some of us, right, you are leading in some kind of way in, in one of the ministries in our church, um, or again, like you just want more training as, as far as uh, how to serve the Lord and uh, just advance the mission of the gospel. Uh, we're having available um, an opportunity to be trained uh, with Harbor U. It's going to be um, starting on Thursday evenings, starting September 2nd from 7 to 9. There's going to have an in-person option. It's going to be here at the Harbor Building, but also a hybrid online option uh, as well. And uh, it's going to be led by um, pastors, Harbor pastors, and uh, it'll be semester long courses, and each, each uh, person involved will be engaged in ministry and mentored by a harbor leader. So if you're just wanting to grow just in, in, in leadership, I want to encourage you to, sh uh, to, to, to come out to this. Uh, info is in our bulletin, so you can just grab a bulletin. Uh, you're going to have to go to the harborhonoluluwebsite.org slash harbor you, and, and that's where you can get more info, and that's where you can sign up. So I'm just really excited for just the opportunity to Again, just partner with, uh, again, we're part of the Harbor family of churches and just have these kind of resources where we can band together, partner together, and be trained and equipped uh, just using the various giftings of the various congregations. So, it, again, if you're interested, I would encourage you to check it out, sign up, uh, and it starts in September, uh, Thursday, uh, Thursday evenings. And just real quick, I want to remind us that we have prayer every Monday night. I've just been so encouraged. Uh, by the, the opportunity that we can be praying as a church, uh, that the Lord would continue to unify us and bring us to greater, uh, just to continue to reach out to the people in our lives and to empower us as a church to, uh, to serve our Lord. And so um, you can talk to Pastor Mike if you're interested, or um, uh, you can just, uh, if you're visit, uh, joining us online, you can email him at mikemason at harborhawaii.org and just uh, get the Zoom link to that. All right, well, we're going to, uh, transition to our passage this afternoon. You can open up to Luke chapter 7 or open up that app on your phone as we continue our series through the Gospel of Luke as we look at this idea of the power of love and how Jesus powerfully shows his love for us uh, in so many different ways. 
as we see that in the Gospel of Luke. Today we're going to look at the power to give life. Jesus is the giver of life. Uh, last we looked out, we spent a few weeks looking at Jesus speaking to his disciples, teaching them what it means to be a follower of him. What are the, what's the cost and what's the benefit of being a disciple of Jesus? So, so Jesus was, was, was teaching his disciples. And then Luke stops that, and in chapter 7, Luke records these two accounts of Jesus working powerfully in two different individual uh, lives. So it's kind of as if where Jesus is, is, is explaining what it means to follow him, and then chapter 7, he shows why he's qualified to be followed. Right? If someone were to tell you, right, imagine someone coming up to you and just saying, hey, like, if you want your life to work, then, then whatever I tell you, put it into practice, and you will be like a man who built himself on a firm foundation, on the rock. Right? If someone were to tell you that, hey, whatever I tell you, listen to it, and your life will not get destroyed by the storm. We'd be like, who are you to tell us that? Like, what, what makes you qualified to demand such a respect for your word? So Jesus here is going to show through these miracles that we're going to read about that he is qualified to be trusted in. Because right, someone can tell you that they can do something, but do they actually have the power and authority to do it? And so Luke is going to show us that Jesus is totally qualified as the Messiah to be fully trusted in. And we're going to see that through two different accounts, the healing of a centurion servant and the raising of a widow's son. And we're going to see how Jesus is the giver of life and what that means. So let's jump right into it. Verse 1, chapter 7. After he finished all his sayings in the hearing of the people, remember he's teaching the people, the disciples, what it means to follow him. He entered Capernaum. Now a centurion had a servant who was sick at the point of death, who was highly valued by him. When the centurion heard about Jesus, he sent them elders of, of the Jews, asking him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they pleaded with him earnestly, saying, He is worthy to have you do this for him, for he loves our nation, and he is the one who built us our synagogue. And Jesus went with them. When he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Here's the first thing that we're going to look at when we think about Jesus and, the, and the, how Jesus is the giver of life. The first is this, is that Jesus gives life for the unworthy. Jesus gives life for the unworthy. So, in this account, this centurion has a servant who is sick and about to die, right, to the point of death, um, and, and he, he was a servant that this centurion uh, valued, valued. And so the centurion hears about Jesus, and we don't know how he hears about Jesus, but he does and believes that Jesus has the power to heal him. So he sends these elders, these leaders of the Jews, to, um, to ask for healing on the centurion's behalf. But notice how the elders approach it. When they come to Jesus, the way they approach it is, this guy deserves to be healed. He is worthy to have you do this for him. The centurion is worthy. But because the centurion, verse 5, loves our nation, and he is the one who built us our synagogue. So in other words, right, the religious, these elders, come to, to Jesus and say, here's why you need to answer this centurion's request. It's because he's worthy of it. He loves our nation, and he built our synagogue. So this centurion is an interesting guy, right? He's not your typical Roman ruler who would probably you know, just uh, treat the Jews as just a conquered people but he seems to have a genuine care for the Jewish people. Perhaps even he was a convert to Judaism. We, we're not too sure. But he loved them to the point of building their synagogue. And the way that these elders approach it is, this guy is worthy to be blessed. And that's kind of what religion teaches, right? Is that it, our relationship with God is transactional, where if we do something good, then God has to, he's obligated to pay us back in some kind of way. That's a transactional view of, of God. We do, and then God gives back to us. That's how the elders viewed it, is th this centurion did good things, so he is worthy of Jesus healing his servant. 
Maybe that's kind of a view that we, we struggle with, or maybe that we have, right? And we get frustrated when God doesn't come through on, on our end, on, on his end, the way that we expect him. So for example, we might say to ourselves, well, if I'm serving God, if I'm trying to love him, then I am worthy to get fill in the blank. What is that thing that we would say, we deserve it? We deserve to get that because we serve God. We're, we're trying to be good. Maybe it is a job, right? A certain job or a certain pay grade. Like, I deserve it. I've served God in this job for X amount of years, so I deserve that. Or maybe it's a relationship, right? I've been good, trying to be good to other people. I've tried to be kind, and so I deserve my, this relationship to work out. God owes it to me, right? It, it could be uh, the health of ourselves, the health of of, of someone that we care for, right? And we say, God, I'm doing everything that I can to love and follow you. Therefore, you're supposed to heal me. You're supposed to heal this person that I love, right? And so the elders are coming with this mindset that, that this man is worthy based upon his deeds. But notice what the centurion says. This is fascinating. This is a Gentile Roman ruler who says this. If we go back to the text, he says this. Right In verse 6, Jesus went with them, the elders. When he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come even under my roof. Right, So here's this contrast where the centurion, right, he sends the elders, and then maybe he thought to himself, oh, you know, like maybe these guys might misrepresent me to Jesus. I'm going to send my friends. So the, the centurion sends his friends to Jesus saying, don't even come to, oh, to my roof. Right? I'm not even worthy for you for us to be in the same, under the same house, in the same house together. That was his view. He had this sense of unworthiness for Jesus to even be around him. He had a more accurate view of his own humanity than these elders, these religious leaders who should have had a better view of their humanity and God's holiness. Jesus, as we're going to see, he's going to heal the centurion servant. Jesus is going to give life for the unworthy. The centurion recognized that he was not worthy of Jesus. He was not worthy of Jesus. And that's interesting, right? Because that, that means that there's nothing the centurion could do to make Jesus heal his servant. No good that he could have done. He believed that he was unworthy. And this was a guy that, that, if there was someone that could think that he was worthy, it could be this guy. A centurion uh, was a very powerful person. He was, a, he was the equivalent to like modern day, uh, like, like an army, I believe it was like an army general, right, pretty high up there. He would be in control of about 100 or more um, soldiers, very powerful, had a lot of authority. Sorry, an army captain, an army captain. And so if there's anyone that would think I'm worthy for this Jewish peasant to come over to my house, it would have been this guy. But he had this view of Jesus, right, that, that we should have. Now, do, do we know if this guy actually believed Jesus was God? We don't know that. But what we do know is he knew that he was not worthy. When we come to know God more and more and to see how great and awesome he is, it becomes more and more apparent how unworthy we are. This is not a bashing of our own selves. Right? We've been made in the image of God, which means that we are treasured and valuable. But because we are sinful by, by nature and choice, right, we are not worthy to be in relationship with a holy God. And so what that means for us is, that means that we then are to approach God humbly, because he is the giver of every good and perfect gift. I started to think about what, like, what makes me think that I am worthy of certain things in my life. You know, there are times where, and I, I'm, I'm sure we've said it or heard it too, where someone might say to us, like, oh man, you so deserve that. You so deserve that. Good for you. You earned that. But then when I started thinking about it, right, how much of what we have in our lives was given by God? We might think, man, I'm, I'm worthy for this at work because I worked hard, I, I advanced, you know, in the workplace, and, and we did, right? But think about it, right? Who gave us the intellectual ability to work hard in the workplace? God. 
right? He gave us our, our intellect, our brains. Who gave us, right, if our bodies are able to function physically, who gave us that health, right? That's God. Um, but I work so hard. Well, who put us living in 2021, living in Hawaii? We didn't have control over that. We could have been born, right, in, uh, let's say, Afghanistan and been a slave in Afghanistan. And, and we would have no control over that. We couldn't boast in, 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 our, in, in the work accomplishments because we'd be a slave, right? So even where we were born, the people in our lives that helped us get to where we are now, a lot of it, we, we, we didn't control that. So when we start to think about our accomplishments and think about, wow, God gave me my intellect, God gave me my personality, God gave me my opportunities, God gave me the people in my life that helped me advance in that area, man, it's humbling because we recognize, wow, like, my boasting really is in the Lord. Because even what I've accomplished by God's grace is because of God blessing me with so many different avenues and ways that we don't even fully see. Even the ability to breathe, right? Think about that. Every breath that we're taking right now, right, is a gift from God. And that humbles us and has us realize, wow, like, everything really is a gift. So I need to appreciate that and be grateful to God for that. And like the centurion, come humbly to Jesus. And the good news is that we can come. Maybe for some of us, the issue isn't we think we're worthy. Maybe the, the issue for us is we know we're unworthy, therefore we, we push ourselves away from God. Here the good news is the centurion knew that he could go to Jesus. He could call out to Jesus even though he knew he was unworthy. Jesus comes for the unworthy. And he gives life for the unworthy. And the way he does that oftentimes is he accomplishes this life, these miracles, through his word. Let's read on. Verse 7 says this, Therefore I did not presume to come to you, but say the word, and let my servant be healed. For I too am a man set under authority, with soldiers under me. And I say uh, to one, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard these words, he marveled at him. And turning to the crowd that followed him said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. And when those who had sent, been sent returned to the house, they found the servant well. So Jesus is just marveling at the centurion, right? The centurion understands authority and command, right? Because he, was, he had authority. He could just say a command and it would happen because of his authority. So he connected that with Jesus since Jesus had authority, over sickness, Jesus could just command the sickness and that sickness would have to go away. And that was the kind of faith that the centurion had and Jesus marveled at it. That word marvel, there's only two places in uh, the Gospels that, that, that Jesus is described as marveling. It's this place and in Mark 6.6 6, when Jesus marvels at his hometown for their unbelief. So in one instance, Jesus is marveling that his hometown does not believe him. And this is the only other case that Jesus is marveling. It's this Gentile centurion who believed that all Jesus needs to do is say the word and his servant would be healed. Jesus brings life through his word. Or think about it when we travel through scripture from the very beginning in Genesis. God created the heavens and the earth by his word. That's how he gave life. Think about how we, we get spiritual life. Right? We believe the gospel, the word of God, the good news of Jesus, and, and we are born again. We're given a new life. Jesus gives us life and works powerfully through his word. And so the question for us then is, do we treasure his word? Do we believe his word? Right? Because if, if, if he works through his word, then gosh, that changes the way we read the Bible. That gets us excited because in his word are so many promises for us that we can trust in and that he will work powerfully because he's committed to his word. So for example, when Jesus, when Jesus promises to give us power in our moment of weakness, right? He told that to Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, where Paul said that, that when I'm weak, then I am strong, that God's grace is sufficient for us in our weakness. We can hold on to that word and that promise of God that he will give us the power that we need 
in our weakness. Do we believe that? So maybe for us, we're weak just spiritually. We feel dry in our relationship with God. We feel defeated, and it's just difficult to get up every single day just to live life. Do we believe that Jesus has the power to give us everything we need to get up and to live by his grace? We can believe it because his word is power. Or maybe for some of us, it's physically, right? We're weak physically. Do we believe that Jesus will give us the power we need to live for him every single day, whether or not he chooses to take away the physical pain and and, and suffering or to show off his power through it? God promises in his word that he will meet us in our weakness with his power. And all we need to do is, is believe his promise and then step out in in faith. You see, because the reason why Jesus' word is powerful is because Jesus himself is powerful. The word is only strong based upon the person who gives it, right? Anyone can come up to us and tell us, hey, you know, I can heal you of that. That that struggle you're going through, I can help you get over it. It's only as, that that, that word that that person is giving you is only as powerful as the, as the person giving it, Right? I can say, okay, I'll, you know, I can tell you, all right, you're going to be healed. But I have no authority to heal, to heal you. But because Jesus has the authority over all, all he needs to do is speak. And he brings life where there is no life. He brings encouragement where there is no encouragement. He brings hope where there is depression and hopelessness. And so we can trust his word that Jesus will do exactly what he says he will do. So my encouragement is next time you read the word, right, ask God to help us approach his word like that. That this is his word given to us and he gives life through his word. And that we are to believe him in the promises that he gives us. Third is this, is that Jesus gives life for those who are hopeless, without hope. Those who are without hope. So the story, the, the account goes from Um, the centurion, a servant who is sick. But what about a person who is dead? Let's go on to verse 11. Soon afterwards, he went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and the great crowd went with him. As he drew near to the gate of the town, behold, a man who, who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a considerable crowd from the town was with her. And when the Lord saw her, He had compassion on her and said to her, do not weep. Wow, I mean, just think about the situation uh, for for this widow. I, I can't imagine what she is going through, right? Here is a woman who lost her husband, or she's a widow, and so she lost her immediate source of provision and protection because in, in, in this culture, women did not have a lot of opportunity to support themselves. It was on It was on the husband. So she lost her primary provision and protection for the present. But not only that, she lost her primary protection and provision for the future. She had a son, an only son, who died. So she lost her present provision and protection in her husband, but then she lost her future protection and provision. Her son died. And I cannot imagine... Outliving, outliving your child. You know, I was reading on the news just about this, 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 upcoming, this, this past week, right, of, of a woman in California, right, who lost her son to road rage. And the way she described it, she said, I never knew that you could feel pain like that. Never knew that there, there was a category to feel that kind of pain, losing your child, outliving your child, losing your child. This woman was going through un unspeakable trauma and pain here, losing her one and only son, right? And, and, and right, many of us, right, we, we felt, right, pain uh, like this that was so searing, that was so overwhelming, right, that was so, um, uh, feels ho- ho- you're hopeless, right? And so bad uh, of a circumstance this was that it says here that a lot of the town came out to mourn with her. That's how, that's how troubled it was. 
that the town even recognized this woman's pain and mourned with her. This was a situation which that seemed all but hopeless. When was the last time that was that like for you? Right? When was the last time that you felt just hopeless? Like things are just so bad that you didn't even want to get out of bed. Right? That even like the, the idea of rolling out of bed didn't even want to do that. Because you just felt, we just felt defeated before the day even started. I'm sure that's what the widow, this widow must have felt, but even more. Right? She lost her family. And Jesus comes and meets her where she's at. And here's the encouraging thing here, is that this woman right, had this situation that was hopeless. She lost her husband. She lost her son. And Jesus meets her. And, and, and Luke describes it here as he had compassion for her. In other words, Jesus met her in her deepest pain and deepest sorrow. He doesn't tell her, right, get over it. He doesn't tell her these emotions that you're feeling, bottle it up and just push it aside. No, he, he meets her in this, this low place of her life and he has compassion, right? That word compassion speaks of this, this inward inward movement in the very core of your body. He felt, he felt for her. And so I want to encourage us here that in the midst of our hardship and sorrow, Jesus feels for us. When we feel like nobody else either understands us or can understand us, Jesus does, and he he meets us there in the sorrow and in the pain. Jesus, right, and think about this, right, this town that she was from, was not a very well-known town. It wasn't like Jerusalem, right? The, the town of Nain is only mentioned in the Gospel of Luke. It's nowhere else mentioned in the Bible. It's this small town that was just so insignificant, but yet Jesus came and met this insignificant woman, this widow, in this insignificant town and met her with compassion. Maybe we feel like we're just this no-name person that no one else you know, pays attention to, that no one else cares for, Jesus met the widow in this small town. Jesus then can meet us in whatever circumstance, no matter how small we feel. Jesus is right there, and he has compassion for for us. But not only can he relate to us, right? He has the power to to change our circumstances. He has the, the power to work miracles. So let's read on in verse 14. Then he came up, and he touched the beer, right? That, that's what held the body. And the bearers stood still. Right? They're like, whoa, this guy just touched, right? Something that was supposed to make him unclean according to the law of Moses. But Jesus transcends, right? Ritual in order to give life. And it says, and he said, young man, I say to you, arise. The dead man sat up and began to speak. And Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized them all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited his people. And this report about him spread through the whole of Judea and all the surrounding country. So here's what we see, right? So Jesus gives life to the hopeless. This widow who is without hope, Jesus comes and meets her where, where, where she's at. But what about someone who's dead? Right? They're helpless. They have no ability to help themselves because they're dead. They have no life. But yet Jesus gives life to the helpless, those who cannot help themselves. And and this young man is the epitome of someone who is helpless. He needed life, and no one else could give it to him but Jesus. And so Jesus comes, right, and he, he meets this young man where he's at, dead, lying there, and he gives this man life. He gives the helpless life. Jesus does this, right? And, and my encouragement for us is, do we believe that this is the Jesus that we serve? And is that reflected in the way that we pray? That we believe that Jesus can do the impossible. We believe that Jesus can work powerfully in our lives and in the lives of other people. And the belief that Jesus has this authority is reflected by the way we pray to him. And so this is encouragement that we have a great and powerful God who gives life to the helpless, who meets us in our hopelessness 
and can work powerfully in and through it. And so we can pray to this great and awesome God. Are you in a situation right now where you, or you know someone who, who feels helpless? Feels helpless. Think about it as, I think the instinct when we feel helpless, right, is, is to like get into emergency mode. We either shut down completely, right, like, oh, this is too much for me, I'm going to shut down and just kind of like isolate ourselves, right? That's, that's one way I think I, I can tend to react to feeling helpless. Or the other way is trying to be in control of everything, going into hyperdrive mode and trying to control everyone and everything around us because this feeling, we don't like that feeling of helplessness. So we have to, we have to get control. But, but think about it like this. If we can change the way we think about times when we, we feel helpless or desperate, think about it whenever we feel helpless or desperate. The next time we feel that way, think about it as an opportunity to intensify our prayer to Jesus. Think about it as an opportunity to grow in dependency upon, upon God. Remember when, uh, when, when John Mark was born and, uh, and God just humbled me so, so, so greatly uh, where, where I thought, eh, ah! You know, I had two kids already. I can handle it, uh, you know, having another kid. And then when we had our third kid, I was just humbled just by the responsibility, just by the time that it takes caring for another child. And it, it humbled me so greatly that I felt like every day, like, I don't know if I'm going to make it. It was just so hard uh, to just do life uh, and have just, just added, added things in, in my life. Good things, but it just felt overwhelming for me. And that forced me to pray more. Like, I felt like I'm so helpless right now, and I need help, uh, that, that it, it led me to pray with Trisha just, just uh, almost on a daily basis for help. And there are just times where we were just like, God, we need help. Like, this is just too much, too much uh, for, um, for, for us to handle. And so I want to encourage us, like, when we're feeling overwhelmed, when we're feeling helpless, think about it as an opportunity then to be able to experience the power of God through going to Him even more more intensely, maybe involving other people in our lives to be praying alongside with us, to share with that other person, hey, like, I'm, I'm overwhelmed right now. I'm feeling helpless right now. I need prayer. Can you pray with me? Because Jesus has the power and the authority to give life and to give help in our most vulnerable states. And so vulnerability, right, is only, it's only bad when we choose to either try to do it all on our own, or, or when we try to just isolate ourselves and just, just give up. But vulnerability is good when we recognize that we need Jesus and we turn to him in our helplessness. So I want to encourage us right, to go to Jesus, use it as an opportunity to grow our prayer life with our Lord Jesus. But this account also points us to this, this giving life to the widow's son also points us to our spiritual life with Christ. That we too were like this young man. We were dead in our sins, Ephesians 2 tells us. We had no relationship with God. We were enemies of God. But God in his great mercy gave us life through the gospel. Jesus touched our hearts, right? The Holy Spirit gave us life and we came to know Christ as our Savior and King and we were regenerated. We were given new life just like this young man man. But not only that, this account points us to an even future uh, life that we will have when, when one day Jesus will return. And it says that all who died before us in Jesus and those of us who still remain will be caught up in the air with our Lord Jesus Christ to be given resurrected bodies, to be given this new life with Christ where we will be with him forever without pain, sickness, and death. Right, And that is the hope that we have in the gospel, right? For, for, for us who, who um, right, are, are, are living, right? Who have experienced, right? Just, just the death, right? Of loved ones in our lives, family members who love our Lord Jesus Christ, Lauren who loved our Lord Jesus Christ, people in our lives, right? Who know Jesus and have gone with Jesus one day, right? Just the hope that we have that just like this, this young man, right? Was raised to life and got back into the community, was given to his mother, we will all one day be raised with Christ and we will all be together with Christ in a new life. And that's the hope that we have in the gospel. That's the hope that drives our living every single day, that we know that this life, it's not it, that we're longing for and looking forward to that day when we're, we're all going to be together and it's going to be one 
big celebration with Christ. Right? And that's what we have coming our way. That's the hope that we have and the comfort that we can experience right now with Jesus. And so I want to encourage us as, as, we, as we lead into to communion and, and, and singing, right, is, is where do we need the power in the life of God in our lives? Were we feeling helpless or hopeless? Maybe it's in a, a relationship, right, where we're trying so hard to love this person in our lives, and, man, we just feel hopeless. Like, we've tried so hard, and we're, we're, we've come to our end. We need the power of God to give us renewed life in that situation. Maybe we're struggling with, with, with things within ourselves, physically, mentally, emotionally, and we're just discouraged. And we need God to breathe new life into, into us. Maybe it's just with our relationship with God. It feels just dry, just empty. And we need Jesus to touch, just like he touched the young man, to touch our spiritual lives, to once again uh, cause us to be in passion, in intimacy with God. Maybe it's in the work, maybe it's in the school, maybe it's in the circumstance where that we need the power in the life of Jesus to, to affect and change and give us a renewed um, power to serve him in those areas. And so I want to encourage us, right, whatever that area is, to turn to Jesus. He wants us to come to him for power, for life, uh, for, for intimacy. Let me go ahead and pray for us. Father, we thank you for these two accounts of our Lord Jesus Christ, that sickness and death do not rule over him, but he has authority over it. And so because of that, we don't have to fear sickness. We do not have to fear death. And we know that you, Lord Jesus, have authority over it. Therefore, in sickness, we can have hope. In death, we can have peace. Because we know that these things have been conquered. Through Christ. And we know one day when you come back, Jesus, it's all going to get done. You're going to get rid of it all. Death, pain, sickness, suffering, all gone. And we can't wait. We can't wait for that day. But until then, Lord, we want to be telling others about this good news. And embolden and empower us, Lord, to share the good news that, that you came died on the cross, rose again so that we would not experience life away from you, but experience the joy and the satisfaction of life with you forever. And Lord, we want to respond now to communion and to song as we worship you in those ways. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we take communion, I want to encourage us, this story of the, the widow and the young man also points us to in a greater way, the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? This widow lost her one and only son. Our Heavenly Father gave up His one and only Son right, to live the perfect life that we couldn't live, to die the death on the cross that we deserve for our sin. But He didn't stay dead. Just like this widow's son, He rose again three days later and gives life to all those who put their faith in him. So communion is an opportunity to celebrate and to remember the resurrection life of Jesus and also the resurrection life that Jesus gives to us. I want to encourage you, if you are a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, to take communion. If you're at home, you can go ahead and gather the communion elements. And this is the second way. We worship our Lord Jesus Christ is through financial giving to advance the gospel through the local church. And you can do that uh, at our website, harbornewwater.org. But let's respond now to the good news of Jesus. If you want to continue sitting and just thinking about the power of Jesus to give life, if you want to stand with us and sing, if you want to go ahead and go in the back and get communion, let's go ahead and worship uh, our great King Jesus, the giver of life. Watches me as I begin to dream, Jesus, it is you. Who brings me food for my table? Who cares?
cares for all of my need. Who walks the road with me, has grown with me through all, and I have been Jesus, it is you. Jesus, it is you. So I lift my hand and I bring my song. All of my days, all of my right, and all.
So I'll go ahead and I'll close with a benediction from Romans 8, 38 and 39. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Well, thank you again so much for coming to Harbor New Wanu. We'll see you guys next week. Aloha.